The Stoa is a digital campfire where we cohere in dialogue about what matters most at the knife's edge of what's happening now. All right, boom. Welcome to the Stoa, everyone. The very last session of the Unsuccess Symposium. Let's get successful so we can stop giving a shit about getting successful. Um, and this one's gonna be fun. Uh, we got uh, Mitch Harwitz here. Uh, Mitch is a historian, a writer on in occult and esoteric themes, author of many books, including the amazing The Miracle Club, How Thoughts Become Reality. Um, and today we were filled with like, you know, productivity methodologies, you know, to talk experts on procrastination and goal setting, um, but nothing really on sort of what, what they would call the new thought movement, uh, sort of like what Napoleon Hill belongs to, uh, where your thoughts become reality. And um, so the title of today's talk is Not So Secret, uh, which is a play off of uh, the, this is my, my suggestion of the title, we'll play off the movie, The Secret, uh, Law of Attraction, Positive Thinking and the New Thought Movement. And um, so how today is going to work, I'm going to tag in Mitch uh, in a moment. Uh, and we didn't have a chance to speak yet because I think he was just rushing over here for an outage. Uh, and he's going to share his thoughts and uh, then we're going to go into Q&A. Um, so throw your questions in the chat anytime. Uh, and this will be on YouTube. So if you don't want to be on YouTube, just indicate that in the chat. So that being said, uh, Mitch, welcome to the STOA. You're, you're on mute. Uh, yeah. Thank you so much. Uh, are you able to hear me OK? Great, thank you. Yeah, as Peter alluded, I had an internet outage at my apartment about uh, four blocks away. So I'm currently in the studio space of my significant other. And um, we haven't been able to get the internet quite right on uh, Noble Street in Greenpoint, Brooklyn. But fortunately, we have a backup studio and I'm very happy to be here with you all. And I'm happy to discuss uh, New Thought in the context of your conference today, because New Thought which is basically the philosophy, as Peter was alluding, that thoughts are causative, is in a certain sense the closest thing we have to an American creed. Uh, this perspective that what you think, uh, to some greater or lesser extent, outpictures in what happens to you, is a philosophy that traverses all of American culture, from New Age spiritual centers to evangelical media ministries. I have walked through the hallways of a boys' high school in Harlem and saw that the kids painted a mural on the wall uh, with a quote from Norman Vincent Peale, author of The Power of Positive Thinking, something to the effect of, if you believe it, you can be it. And at the same time, the outgoing occupant of the White House uh, professes to have been inspired by Norman Vincent Peale when he was growing up here in New York City. Uh, in fact, The Power of Positive Thinking is the only book that I've ever heard uh, Donald Trump discuss it. Maybe the only book he's ever read for all I know. But in any case, it's a very, very unusual American transcendental philosophy. And I say it's unusual, not only because it's native grown to America, but because again, as I was suggesting, it, it traverses all boundaries of our political, economic, and socially determined culture. There are a lot of people who adhere to some variant of new thought philosophy. It goes under many, many different names, secret law of attraction, none of which I particularly favor, which I'll say something about in my brief talk. Uh, it commands tremendous loyalty of people from, again, many different walks of life across our country. It also, instigates and inspires a lot of ire and a lot of anger in people because uh, many people feel that it's uh, simply what is called magical thinking, it's fantasy, it's, it's buying off people's dedication to either social change or some more authentic expression of themselves uh, in favor of this fantastic idea that you think it and so it becomes reality. Uh, you know, it's funny, I, I recall several months ago, there was a writer who had an op-ed in the Washington Post where she maintained that Donald Trump and Marion Williamson, the new age self-help writer who was running for president briefly in the Democratic primaries are essentially the same person because they both participate in this 
narcissistic philosophy of self-fulfillment. And, you know, this is where I part ways with mainstream journalists and historians apropos of new thought, as much as I part ways with some of the true believers. The fact is, Marianne Williamson and Donald Trump are not the same person. There are all kinds of ways that they differ politically, socially, educationally, in terms of background, in terms of personal style. The fact that they both adhere to some version of this thought causation philosophy that could be called new thought, a term that came into use here in the United States in the 1890s and, and other parts of the world, of course. Um, the fact that they both adhere to that philosophy doesn't mean they're the same person. It means they come from the same place. The fact that you could meet school kids in Harlem who thought it was a good idea to create a, a hallway mural enshrining a quote by Norman Vincent Peale doesn't mean they are the same as Donald Trump. They are not. They are not. But they are from 21st century America, the 21st century Western world. And this philosophy is one that has the command of a vast range of people who have their own differences and point of view, who weave within and without it. It's almost like trying to talk about Christianity. Pat Robertson is a Christian. Martin Luther King was a Christian. You would never suggest that they were the same people, even though they both had uh, a salvific view of religion, even though they both believed in a Southern Baptist sin and salvation model of religion. Yes, they had that much in common. And the differences between them are so vast and epic that it would seem on its face to say it's ridiculous that these two are the same people because they both went to divinity school, because they both profess to be Christians, because they both believe in certain tenets of the sin and salvation model. Likewise, I would say that America's positive thinking tradition doesn't define people as being the same. It defines them as being from the same cultural territory, which is very, very heavily influenced by that point of view. Now, Peter was holding up a book I wrote called The Miracle Club. And that is a book that's both of history and practice. I define myself very freely, cards on the table, as a believing historian. I write with critical sympathy about these movements. And I feel it's important uh, to be frank about that, to be transparent about that. The fact is, most historians of religion would never refer to themselves as believing historians. But in many, many cases, the people who document religious movements, old and new, emerge from those same congregations. Some of the most important books, some of the most foundational books that have been written about new religious movements, Mormonism, Christian science, as well as ancient religious traditions, Judaism, Catholicism. These things are written, in fact, by people who emerge from and still identify as part of the congregations that they're writing about. I don't think that fealty or participation in a certain movement is a barrier to critical thinking. Among the best minds, it can facilitate critical thinking because it helps you get in touch with the values that emanate from that religious movement, whether it's traditional or alternative. And it gives you a very intimate skin to skin impression of what's right and what's wrong with that movement. What's, I'll start with what's wrong about uh, new thought philosophy, positive mind philosophy as it's practiced today. And it doesn't have anything to do with the secret and so on, you know. I mean, I appreciate the title of the talk because it's relevant, it's relevant. But the secret, is now about 14 years old, came out in 2006. Um, I've criticized The Secret. I wrote a book called One Simple Idea, which was a history of the positive mind movement in America. And I'm, I'm critical of The Secret. I have deep, deep differences with its creator, Rhonda Byrne. And yet, and yet, 
I really don't participate in what I perceive as this kind of ritualistic dumping on and tearing apart of the secret. Anything that anybody says about the secret in the 21st century was said and probably better by H.L. Mencken, the American literary critic in the 1920s, 19 teens, because this movement has been around in one form or another for about 125 years, 150 years. And it's always had its detractors and its adherents. And believe me, in a century, the issues have not changed. They have not changed. And one of the difficulties in talking about this movement is because its supporters and its detractors tend to describe it based on its extremes. And that's a problem. So let me start with the extremes of the New Thought movement. This movement that thoughts are causative grew out of the ferment of transcendentalist theology in New England uh, in the mid to late 19th century. And in its inception, it was originally a medical movement, uh, a me medicine in the United States, uh, probably in Canada as well, from a scientific perspective was in a really abysmal place throughout much of the 19th century. Physicians, were treated pretty well in Europe and they didn't have a very strong reason to make the dangerous and very upending journey along the Atlantic. And so for a long time, there were very few teaching hospitals in North America, very few, nothing like what we would know today as residency programs. And uh, the state of medicine was just atrocious. I go into this in one simple idea and people sought out all kinds of alternative methods, including homeopathy, botanical remedies, remedies that we've forgotten all about today. And one of these things was what, what, what might be called prayer therapy or mental healing. And lo and behold, this eventually morphed into what by the 1890s became the New Thought Movement, which held to the belief system that thoughts are causative. And there were lots of testimonials in journals, diaries, articles uh, to this effect, um, there were exciting things going on at that time where people began to reference a subconscious mind or a subliminal mind, a concept that's much newer to us than we would really think. Um, in the late 1700s, for example, early 1800s, there weren't really these conceptions of a mind that went beyond the cognitive, of a mind that went beyond uh, list making and motor functions and things like that. The idea that there was this suggestible, glacial, unseen thought center that might just be the real engine driving us in terms of conflicts and all kinds of repetitions and things in our lives that, that we maybe can't fully understand or grasp or get to the antecedent of. Western psychology didn't, it didn't really exist, you know, until very late in the game, you know, late, late into the 19th century in ways that we understand it today. So people who were experimenting with these ideas of there being a hidden antecedent within this structure that we call our minds, a term that even today is not easy to define, a term that even today can engender full-throated debates about whether thought is just an epiphenomenon of gray matter. Is it like bubbles in a glass of carbonated water? And when the water is gone, the bubbles are gone, or is there something non-local about it? You know, and those are serious questions. Uh, I won't have time in our, in our hour this evening to get into what I regard as the depth of those questions, but it was more than just fantasy or medical necessity, I believe that was pushing people in the direction of thinking about thought causation. Again, you know, this was an era before placebo studies, certainly before neuroplasticity or, you know, fields that are interpreted today uh, within the framework of this discussion, whether it be quantum theory or academic psychical research and so on and so forth. They had an early instinct for the antecedent of thought in ways that was very fresh and that was very new. So it, it wasn't just that people were imagining things um, and saying to themselves, gee, wouldn't this be great if, you know, they were struggling 
to find a language, which was a religious language, to make reference to what we today talk about as the subconscious mind. Again, in an era before placebo studies, before um, popularizations of quantum theory, before quantum theory itself, before questions of perspective, relativity, neuroses, trauma, or anything like what we know today in terms of mind-body medicine. Everybody today accepts that stress, for example, plays a role in disease, a role. We didn't have that language back then. So the folks that were experimenting with new thought were, for me, in many ways, very, very inspiring. They were a very interesting group of adventurers. <sighs> Although as time passed, the positive mind movement did a better job of popularizing itself than it did of refining itself. Uh, William James, who's a real intellectual hero to me, he was very interested in all this material, which he called the religion of healthy mindedness. And he wrote about it, thought about it, studied it. But after James died in 1910, the movement didn't grow very much. Um, it grew in terms of popularity, but it didn't grow in terms of maturation or refinement, which is why people feel very frustrated today, which is why H.L. Mencken felt frustrated in the 1920s that the movement seemed to produce a lot of adherents who were very prepared to embrace what we today would call the law of attraction. Again, a term from the 19th century that underwent some permutations and mutations didn't really start to be used in the way people use it today until very late in the game, late 19th century, early 20th century. But the New Thought movement became dominated by this notion that we live under one mental super law, which again, in, in popular language today would be called the law of attraction. And I think that was a very, very limiting foundation on which the New Thought Movement was built. And it kept the movement, I think, from responding to suffering. You know, New Thought has never done a good job of arriving at a theology of suffering. And that's particularly problematic in our generation when we're dealing with end of life issues in a really new way. People are living longer, but they're not necessarily living healthier. Uh, the pandemic, obviously. Managing chronic disease, managing grief, managing addiction. I think New Thought can provide the discriminating person with insight into all these things, but it's never really refined itself to the point of having I think a sweeping moral critique, a purposeful critique when dealing with suffering, when dealing with social iniquity, when dealing frankly with things that are just very easily understood as problems of geography and demographics and natural disaster. It's, it's insufficient, it's insufficient. And yet at the same time, I also believe that the New Thought Movement had some core critical early insights. And I continue to believe today that there is something redeemable and important and worthwhile and sustaining in that movement. Uh, I, won't go into, I won't go into great detail because I, I want us to be able to open up the floor to an exchange, which is what today's event is all about. But I will say the following. I think here in the uh, early decades of the 21st century, I personally believe that the philosophy of materialism is as insufficient in capturing the byways of life uh, in some respects as new thought itself is, insofar as materialism as a philosophy believes that matter creates itself. You know, I'm referencing back to the mind very hard to define, uh, being strictly an epiphenomena of the brain. And again, 
the brain is gone, the mind is gone. The glass of carbonated water is gone. Well, the bubbles in the glass are gone. And that's largely how materialism views the mind. And this becomes more and more problematic in an age when we all like to talk about things like artificial intelligence without, I think, personally being able to fully define what intelligence is. Um, small example. In recent years, uh, a new field has become popular, widely known, widely talked about, widely written about in medical journals that's called neuroplasticity. And the field of neuroplasticity very simply demonstrates that sustained thoughts alter the neural pathways through which electrical impulses travel in your brain. And brain scans demonstrate this. And this data is not controversial. More fantastic than the data itself are the implications of the data. This is not supposed to be happening. This is not how we grew up. Your thoughts held over a sustained period of time are not supposed to be altering the gray matter of your brain. They are a product of the gray matter of your brain. And just to get into the implications of that field alone, which is not controversial in its findings, places us in front of remarkable questions. Advances in placebo studies place us in front of remarkable questions. We live in an age where we have seen the success of placebo surgeries, for example. We have seen in various studies atmospheres of uh, nostalgia among elderly folk reversing certain physical manifestations of age-related decline. We have seen placebo studies where the, the so-called placebo effect is enacted transparently when people know they're being given uh, a sugar pill, so to speak. We have seen the persistence, and this is controversial, and I don't want us to sort of go off the rails talking about this. I write about it in other places, but we have seen the persistence of academic psychical research or ESP research, which statistically demonstrates the anomalous transfer of information in laboratory settings. The critics will say, you know, those are mistakes or the very appearance of uh, any kind of result in the data shows itself that the data is polluted. And I just don't think any of that stands up. Uh, whether or not one believes in the ESP thesis or if even if such things are possible, the statistics have been gathered that are suggestive or at least raise questions about the transference of information in a way that goes beyond our ordinary sensory understandings in lab settings. And then, <clears throat> of course, we have all the questions that emerge from quantum theory and uh, whether and to what extent and how and why decisions to take measurements or not take measurements in double slit experiments and other kinds of experiments are determinative of locality. A particle exists in a wave state, so to speak, superposition. These are all metaphors. And then when somebody takes a measurement, only then is the particle localized to a particular place. No one challenges 90 years of this data. What's questionable, what's controversial are the implications of this data. So, I do feel that the ancestors of New Thought, although that movement never adequately developed, and part of what I'm doing in my work today, I suppose, is making my own effort to nudge along the maturation of a movement that I think didn't go through appropriate maturation. But I do think that they were instinctively, viscerally onto something. And uh, as such, I write not only from a historical, but also from a practical perspective as a believing historian or as a figure of critical sympathy about uh, these movements and these methods. I take them very seriously. Uh, William James took them seriously. And I think with good reason, James felt that uh, at least in the early 20th century, I think the same thing is true in the early 21st century, that kind of the blanket dismissal of these ideas is stifling of, of human experiment, is stifling of the reach for possibilities that exists within environs of life, everyday environs of life, from which there emerges testimony 
that should be paid attention to. Testimony can be a record. And I don't think it's sufficient. I don't think it's wise. I don't think it's necessary to cry confirmation bias, magical thinking. You know, I think there are a lot of important inquiries in our world today that are based upon testimony. We don't really know exactly how SSRIs work, for example. We rely upon the testimony of the patient. And if you've ever taken an SSRI, as I have and as I do, you know that in working with your, your doctor, you're tweaking, you're trying. If you've ever suffered pain and been in a hospital, we don't have an absolute scale by which to measure pain. We measure it by, by testimony. Now, I take these things seriously. They're not the only game in town, but I do think they matter. And this is what, why James was encouraging experiment in these areas. And I think today, I think today, the reasons for those experiments, apropos of some of the fields I was referring to, have stood up reasonably well. Likewise, the field, as I was alluding, has not matured, has not asked itself enough questions. There is, and may my friends in the New Thought Movement forgive me, there is a childish atmosphere that pervades that movement, uh, that pervades a, a fair amount of its literature, that certainly pervades the culture of its conferences. Uh, I know one of the things that really concerns people about new thought or other related mind-based metaphysical systems is that there, there, there's the perception that there can be a victim blaming mentality, that the individual is accused of being responsible for his or her own situation. And I, I take that seriously. I don't wave that off. And one of the things I try to bring into the discussion in my books and my talks is that if a person agrees with me that there's something there, it also stands to reason. And it's vital, I think, to note as much as possible that we experience many, many laws and forces. And uh, I, can, I can have vast ranging epic discussions about whether mind, not so easy to define, is the ultimate reality. And I, I am very, very interested in these discussions. And these discussions can be had among serious students of metaphysics and among serious students of physics. I care about these discussions, none of which I'm really going into tonight. But even if that's a good question, you know, is the mind the ultimate basis of reality? Even if that's a good question, and I believe it is, we experience many laws and forces. We experience mass. We experience physical decline. We experience demise. There's never been an exception to that. Likewise, we also experience linear time, but we know intellectually, we know that linear time is basically a device. It's a very, arguably, it's a very necessary illusion. Since Einstein, we've been aware that time is relative that time will speed up. I mean, I'm sorry, that time will slow down based upon velocity. We know that time will slow down in environments of extreme gravity like black holes. So what we refer to as time is not really this ultimate thing. We experience it. You know, I realized that my internet service was down and I, I, I emailed Peter over my cell phone and said, okay, you know, I'm gonna really try not to be late. I'm rushing up the block so I can be on by six o'clock. I experience time as very real, but it's not. We know this, we know this. We know from relativity that there are exceptions to linearity. It's not constant, it's not lawful, although we experience it as constant and lawful. Gravity is not constant. Again, talk about another concept that's difficult to define. Let's say gravity is mass being attracted to itself. That's one way of putting it. Well, you're going to experience the absence of gravity in the vacuum of space, but it is there. It is there. Objects are attracted to one another or they wouldn't revolve around one another, for example. So mind is one of these wonderful, wonderful 
ineffables in a certain sense. We can track pieces of it, fragments of it, puzzle pieces of it, results of it. We can do the same for time. We can do the same for gravity. The question is, and this is a question that, you know, to be perfectly frank, haunts me, is any of what I'm describing of practical use to the individual? That's a very tough question. And it ought to be a tough question because it's based on subjectivity and experience and testimony. My estimation is that it is of use to the individual or I wouldn't be writing in the field. But it's imperative that for it to be of use to the individual, there have to be other greater understandings that come in. And quite frankly, I think probably one of the reasons why I'm not troubled more by the secret, for example, which a lot of people really hate. You know, I mean, somebody must have liked it. You know, millions of people bought the book, but everyone I meet, including dyed in the wool new agers, always rush to tell me like, oh, I don't go in for the secret, you know, as if that's the entry fee to some sort of seriousness. You know, the reason I'm untroubled by the secret is because I, I frankly, in my experience, I don't see people watching that movie or reading that book and making disastrously dangerous or deluded uh, decisions because of it, engaging in some ruinous spending spree or something. At the same time, our outgoing American president is somebody who was widely seen as a, a guy who engaged in a lot of reality distortion. I don't think that's controversial. Obviously, it isn't like the 47.3% of Americans who voted for him, some of whom are among my readers, some of whom get very angry at me when I talk that way, but he, was, he is a figure who engaged in a disastrously depleting, damaging uh, kind of reality distortion. Should I be haunted by the fact that he cites a book like The Power of Positive Thinking as the formative book for him when he was a, a kid, the only book he's ever talked about? Yes, I should be haunted by that. I am concerned about that. I am concerned about that. I'm concerned about a lot of philosophies that get abused depending on whose hands that they're in. You know, I mean, Bernie Sanders is a socialist. So have been people who have engaged in horribly, disastrously misbegotten social experiments. Is there something intrinsic in a philosophy that makes it open to abuse? You know, that's a question that I'm, I'm very willing to, to engage in with, with all of you, uh, because I think if I run away from that question, then I just become a kind of polemical figure. Uh, so I'll, I'll leave it there. Uh, I'm very grateful to have a chance to talk to you all. I'm grateful I found a working internet signal. And, uh, and thanks to Peter for organizing this forum today. And um, I'm happy to open it up for exchange. Beautiful. Um, I'm just gonna go directly to the, the chats because there's a lot of uh, great questions. Um, yeah. And the one that I was gonna ask you actually, Pranab uh, wrote it down. So if you could unmute yourself and ask your question to Mitch. Yeah. Um, what are some of the limits and pitfalls of uh, I guess common uses of new thought or this whole kind of thing in general? And how do you think those can be limited? Um, either like externally or maybe from a good friend um, or even from oneself kind of. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> it's very easy to uh, weaponize uh, positive mind philosophy. It's easy to weaponize a lot of things. And sometimes I don't like when I see uh, individuals, either patients or people in recovery or people who are suffering from depression or addiction, get told that there is a certain way to think, that there is a certain way to be. I think there, that's very oppressive, you know, to the individual. And um, I, I, I don't think in the cases that I've encountered in the people that I've hung around and I've hung around a lot of them, I don't, 
I don't feel I've personally seen people do disastrous things like reject medical treatment or spend their way into some sort of a terrible hole because they just believe that, you know, right thought will bring lots of monopoly money flowing, you know, to them. I, I'm sure such things have occurred. I have no doubt about that. I haven't personally witnessed much of it. What I do witness more of is that there's a kind of, there can be a, a you know, a kind of limiting orthodoxy that, that a person gets hit with. Uh, for example, I said earlier that I take an SSRI and I try to make a point about being very upfront about that because there's an attitude, there's an attitude within certain reaches of the new age culture, within certain reaches of the new thought culture, within certain reaches of the recovery movement like AA and so on, that taking a pill is somehow cheating. And I think that's very wrong. I think that limits people's options. I mean, by the same token, you know, wearing glasses would be cheating. You know, I mean, it's just, it's a device, you know, it's a device. You try everything uh, that will contribute to your, to your recovery. You try everything that contribute to your well being. You know, you wouldn't say to somebody, well, you know, you broke your leg, sorry, but using crutches is a, um, it's cheating. You know, I mean, why would taking a pill be cheating? You know, it, it, again, you know, it, it's a device that you avail yourself of and you try different things. I don't like seeing uh, any treatments stigmatized. So within the new thought movement, within the new age movement, for example, sometimes, sometimes uh, pharmaceuticals or things that may be very helpful to the individual will get stigmatized. I mean, I know people who have uh, ADHD and they take Ritalin and it's made a great difference in their lives and it's really, really helped them. And they're very capable of describing it to, to anybody who will listen. Other times, you know, Ritalin might get overprescribed, but I do find that the danger is sometimes these things will get stigmatized. It's like, well, you're not engaged in the right kind of self-development if you're taking this drug or that drug or what have you. And I do feel that that's a problem in, the, in that culture uh, that, that I, I don't like because, because I think it can stigmatize. Thank you. And Thank you. Um, Peter, do you think I could ask the second question on, um, and, and on the flip side, kind of, I guess that kind of bounces off that last response you had, you know, the fact that for the typical new thought people, sometimes pharmaceutical pills are helpful. And then what are some ways to show people who are maybe more materialistic in the scientific sense, materialist, or just, hyper-rational uh, for them to kind of see the benefits or get buy-in around this idea of um, positive thought? You know, it's, it's a fascinating question. I really appreciate that. And there are a lot of emotions that get drummed up when people talk about this material, because some of the people who come from a more materialist perspective are very concerned that guys like me are giving approbation to irrationality. You know, there are people who feel that way about me and feel like, you know, well, you know, Horowitz will have us believing in unicorns tomorrow, you know, and I'm trying hard to find a language where we can have a conversation about these things without it kind of going off the rails into something very emotional, which happens very quickly. And I understand that because I have some of those emotions myself. For example, I am very, very averse to conspiracy theories. There's a lot of conspiracy theorizing within the new age culture. I'm, I'm pro-vaccine. I have two sons. I would never dream of not giving them vaccines. I'm very aware there are people in the developing world who would give anything, you know, if they could give vaccines to their kids. And, and yet, you know, in, in, in my neighborhood, so to speak, you know, there are people who are very anti-vax or vaccine questioning and that I get emotional about that point of view, you know, and I, 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 I have my reasons, you know, whereas the materialist folk, you know, they get emotional too when they hear me talking about some of this stuff. And my wish is that we could find a language where, you know, we can classify things and say, well, wait a minute. Um, if what I'm talking about is not uh, objectifying anybody, if what I'm talking about is not compromising somebody's safety or compromising the public safety, then I think, you know, if we've established a kind of ground rules for that, then I think we can have a conversation. 
And the risk of not having those conversations is a real limit on human understanding. Now, one of the things I write about in the Miracle Club, and I cannot tell you how carefully I struggled to write about this in a very measured way. In the 1980s, there was a psychiatrist in um, Australia named Ainsley Mears, who conducted experiments in intensive meditation with cancer patients who had received a terminal uh, a diagnoses. And because they were, because they were, they were, they had received terminal diagnoses, many of his subjects had discontinued treatment and, and they would engage with him in intensive meditation. And he basically found about a 10% correlation between intensive meditation and um, cases of spontaneous remission. And there are cases of spontaneous remission. And this material must never be talked about in a shorthanded way. You know, the medical literature documents uh, here in the United States about maybe 15 cases a year of spontaneous remission. And so the question is why? Well, you know, there might've been a misdiagnosis. Maybe the person never had cancer to begin with. Uh, the person's immune system might've been compromised because of another virus. Maybe the virus lifted and something happened. Um, maybe a uh, person had a virus that had cancer fighting properties. You know, we, we don't know, but these cases of spontaneous remission, very rare, but also very consistent. Mears felt that the psychological could not be discounted from that discussion. And again, the last thing on earth any decent person wants to do is give false hope to a terminally diagnosed individual. But he did find, and I, I go through this in the Miracle Club and I, I provide the, the, the appropriate references. He did find there was about a 10% correlation between cases of spontaneous remission and intensive meditation. When I try to write about this, when I try to talk about this, and I, I hope I've given you some impression of how, how deeply I care uh, not to exaggerate any of this material, there are sometimes physicians who get very angry with me and who think, you know, oh my God, you know, you're, you're, you're selling people on miracles. And, you know, I want to sort of stop the, the, the car and say, well, wait a minute, do you, do you really feel that, that that's what I'm doing? I mean, can't, Admittedly, it's fantastic, uh, it's difficult material and it's easy to exploit, it's easy to exploit, but let's make the effort together not to exploit it, to have a discussion about it. And my wish is, and so far my wish has not come true, uh, but my wish is that we could find terms where serious uh, skeptics and critical uh, believers, uh, to, you know, if I can put it that way, uh, can have a conversation. And I, I do believe those terms exist. They're very, very hard to find. Uh, I have not found them, uh, but I'm, I'm, I'm trying. Thank you. That was Thank you. Good. Thank you. Uh, let's go with Megan. Um, thanks. Um, I wanted to uh, double click on this idea of victim blaming. Um, I think you said uh, that the individual can be accused of being responsible for their circumstances. Yeah. Um, and this sounds to me like we're kind of mixing together the idea of blame with the idea of responsibility. Mm -hmm. um, and the, the fear of blame thing is uh, clearly like a really strong force for a lot of individuals and even kind of on a systemic level, this kind of fear of blame is... Um, is a really major driver and the mixing together of responsibility with blame seems to me like something we could really tease out. So the question that I had was uh, one, your opinion is the feature uh, features of a culture that, um, that appropriately distinguishes between blaming and between taking personal responsibility is that the ability to respond. And I see that in a positive sense. I'd like to, to tease out the, the positivity in that. Yeah, I, it's a wonderful question. Um, you know, I think that touches upon, uh, it, it may be indirect, but it, but it touches upon issues of um, transparency within placebo studies, for example. You know, I was alluding earlier that there was a, several years ago at Harvard Medical School, which recently established a, a program in, in the mind and the therapeutic response, uh, there was a so-called transparent placebo study where sufferers of irritable bowel syndrome were given, a, in essence, a sugar pill. And they were told, you know, transparently, you're being given a sugar pill. And 
59% uh, of the subjects reported sustained and lasting relief as opposed to a much, much smaller number in the control group, which I think was like, uh, you know, it was in the neighborhood of 15% or something like that. So, you know, it was a statistically significant uh, event. And I looked at this and I said to myself, okay, you know, and to the researchers credit, they didn't over extrapolate, you know, from what had happened, you know, they didn't, they didn't rush to promulgate any pet theories about, well, you know, why did this happen? But it seems to me, it seems to me that the trigger of the placebo response is hopeful expectancy. And, and, you know, when I read this data, I said to myself, is there a way to responsibly engender hopeful expectancy in the patient, you know, and sometimes there is, and sometimes there isn't. And sometimes perhaps it would be wrong to engender hopeful expectancy when there's no reason to be hopeful, you know, and, and when a person maybe needs to prepare for hospice or, you know, something like that. But I asked myself the question of, you know, apropos of the individual responsibility of the patient, how, what is, what is a way, what is a responsible, mature way to encourage some sort of constructive thought, if not hopeful thought on the part of the person and the, the person, the patient, I mean, there's obviously some responsibility there, you know, um, and, and that can take different forms. I don't think that has to take the form of um, uncritical thinking, but the patient I think that is engaged with his or her treatment in a, a really complete and total way, there is a quality of responsibility there that probably has therapeutic value. Um, you know, when I was speaking to I was talking to a um, breast cancer researcher at Harvard Medical School several years ago about this data that I was describing from this psychiatrist, Ainsley Mears in uh, Australia. And Mears was just brilliant because he's one of the only people whose data on spontaneous remission gets included in the mainstream medical literature because he kept appropriate records and he was very rigorous. I think he died in 86, so he hasn't been with us for a long time but I was speaking to a researcher in breast cancer at Harvard Medical School and I was describing this data to him. And this was just a conversation, strictly informal. And at one point he said to me, you know, the truth is something that my colleagues and I talk about in private is that when people have a positive disposition towards their treatment, we notice that they do better and we don't know why that is. And that was it, you know, and this is just two people having a conversation, albeit an informed conversation. And, you know, it's an interesting statement. And I, I wrote about this, I mentioned this statement, again, framing it anecdotally. And again, you know, I mean, there were some physicians who took umbrage at it and were very upset, you know, and, and I understand that because they're concerned about victim blaming you know, as, as you were alluding or giving false hope. And yet my colleague, my friend, he was, I think, in a sober way, describing to me anecdotally something that he and his colleagues just talk about in private. So I, I think, you know, there is some role of responsibility for the patient, but it has to be a responsibility that's, I suppose, not one size fits all. You know, the idea of being encouraged to think um, positively can just be horribly oppressive to a depressed person or to an anxious person. So I think there might need to be some other language. You know, I use the term positive thinking because it's widely known and I just want to be understood in a general sense. But, you know, maybe it's not really positive thinking in the sense that we conventionally understand it. It's a kind of deliberative thinking. It's an understanding that uh, the mind, along with lots of other things, seems to evince some effect on us or, you know, on our surroundings in a way that goes beyond the cognitive. I, I, I'd like to find a different language so that people don't feel like they're being encouraged in directions that might not suit their needs, you know, at a given moment. 
but that they can still avail themselves of something you know, very constructive. I, I hope that's helpful in, in, in addressing your question. Cool, thank you, Megan. Um, so we have about 10 more minutes before um, the top of the hour. And, um, and this is gonna be the end of the Unsuccess Conference for the day. And so I was thinking it would be good to like leave us with something to do potentially. Uh, and I know your book, uh, The Miracle Club, uh, I think it was the fourth chapter, you had a series of exercises like visualization, affirmation, chanting, um, that would help manifest one thought uh, into reality. Um, so I'm curious, what do you use and what would you recommend for us to maybe experiment with? Sure, sure. Um, personally, I don't use the term manifest, although again, I, I, I recognize it's, it's, it's part of the culture and it, it's, it's people generally know what it's referring to. Um, in the Miracle Club, I write about my preference for the term select and I have my reasons for that, but which I won't get into, you know, at our final minutes. Uh, but in terms of an exercise, I'll suggest the following. Um, in the early 20th century, there was a French mind theorist who was very popular for a time named Emile Coué, who some of you might have heard of. And he was famous and in some quarters infamous for uh, coining a phrase, a mantra, day by day in every way I am getting better and better. And Coué died, I think it was in 1926, but he made lecture tours in Europe and, and, and in North America a couple of times. And he had thousands of followers and he had an equal number of detractors who said, you know, understandably, how could any childish little sing song thing like that make a difference in any serious person's life? But one of the things that Kuwait's critics uh, missed is that he had a very, very early instinct for uh, a state of mind that uh, sleep researchers later came to identify as hypnagogia. And hypnagogia is this very, very relaxed state that we enter into just before we're uh, falling to sleep at night. And just as we're coming to wakefulness in the morning, in the morning it's called hypnopompia, there are slight differences in the state. But when you are in this so-called hypnagogic state, you are in a kind of exquisitely suggestive state you you're experiencing maybe stream of consciousness thoughts you might have waking dreams you might have hallucinations you might hear noises but you do have a, a measure of cognitive control in other words you can direct your thoughts and so kue believed that if you used his day-by-day -day mantra uh and whispered it to yourself just 20 times before drifting to sleep at night in this hypnagogic state, and 20 times just as you were coming to in the morning, that you would be engaging in a kind of self-hypnosis, which he called auto-suggestion. He didn't see himself as a metaphysical thinker. He didn't see himself as being in league with religious thought or transcendentalist thought necessarily. He believed that he was making a therapeutic application of hypnosis and that we can engage in self-hypnosis. And so the reconditioning. One of the things that I personally engage in, and I invite you to try, see what the results are, is uh, devising some mantra, it doesn't have to be his, it could be any mantra, or some visualization or some expression of a desired state uh, according to the formula that he prescribed. Again, just as you're drifting to sleep at night, whisper it to yourself 20 times. Just as you're coming to in the morning, whisper it to yourself 20 times. Kuwe had a very rough early instinct for a lot of things, um, including placebo studies that were later validated clinically almost a century after his death. Kuwe was a, a pharmacist in Northwestern France in a town called Troyes. And Kue made the observation that when he would speak favorably of a certain prescription to a patient, they would seem to do better with the prescription. Another study at, at Harvard Medical School found that the placebo response seems to be active even when patients are given active drugs, not just a, a sugar pill, so to speak. And they found that the placebo effect, this was a study from maybe about six years ago, placebo effect 
is ever operative. It's operative even when the individual is given an active substance. He or she seems to do better with it. And I asked Ted Kapchuk, who runs Harvard's program in placebo studies, were you thinking of Kue when you were and your colleagues designed this experiment? He said, you know, we were not, but, but it, it does seem to comport with his instinctive early findings. So Kue was an interesting guy and uh, it's worth experimenting with his ideas. So if you wanna try something practical, uh, I would uh, use his prescription, if not his specific mantra and use this hypnagogic state. He didn't have that term in the early 20th century, we have it today. Sleep researchers are able to identify the state through brain scans and so on. Very relaxed state, very physically immobile state, very unusual state where the mind sort of bends and morphs almost like the appearance of a Salvador Dali painting. And yet you retain cognition. You can make decisions. You can make a decision to repeat a mantra or a visualization to yourself just before drifting to sleep, just coming to in the morning. Announce a desirable state to yourself. You know, see what it does. See if it helps. See if it makes a difference. And if um, people decide to design their own, is there any heuristics you would recommend um, in order not to create like a dangerous affirmation? Oh, that's a great question. You know, Kue used his affirmation because he thought it was just general and it kind of covered the bases. I would say... Just whatever is emotionally persuasive to you. You know, some people in the New Thought Movement get very hung up on, should it be present tense? Should it be future tense? If it's future tense, am I pushing off the thing I want into the future? I, I think that that's, that's splitting unnecessary hairs. Just make it emotionally persuasive. And to look, you know, don't be afraid to make it, uh, uh, you know, people talk about think bold, you know, well, think modestly, you know, I mean, it doesn't have to be bold. If, if, if announcing something to yourself modestly is more emotionally persuasive, in other words, if you're not reaching for the moon, but you're reaching for something that's just milder, um, do so, you know, just do whatever is emotionally persuasive. I think that's, that's if, if, if self-hypnosis or if auto-suggestion or if self-suggestion or call it whatever you want, if it's effective, if it's real, it's real because it's emotionally persuasive. So I would say start from that place. Awesome. So uh, everyone has some homework, create some uh, stoic affirmations. Uh, right. <laughs> <laughs> um, so that being said, uh, Mitch, any closing thoughts of where people can find you, your work um, before we sure. close out today? Um, you can find all my books at a struggling little startup called uh, Amazon and um, they're going to really break through someday or wherever you purchase your books. My website is MitchHorowitz.com. I'm on social media. I'm on Twitter at Mitch Horowitz. I'm on Instagram at Mitch Horowitz 23. Uh, my email is on my website. Uh, so if you try this experiment and you have results you want to share, um, feel free to drop me a line. Beautiful. Uh, so in a moment, I'll make some closing announcements. But Mitch, thanks so much for rushing over here and coming to the store today. Thank Greatly you. Greatly appreciate it. Enjoy it. Um, so that was the end of the Unsuccess Symposium. If you missed some of the episodes, they'll probably uh, be posted after uh, Christmas. Um, tomorrow, we have uh, an event. Um, it's like monogamy versus uh, polyandry, uh, something like that. Uh, there's a professor that's going to pit the two together. So that should be fun. That's on the stoa.website, stoa.ca. So you can check that out. That being said, uh, Mitch, everyone, thanks for coming out to the Thank you. today. Appreciate it. Enjoyed it. Thank you very much.